Thank you very much, Lee. It's a pleasure to be here at the Institute for Systems Biology. In one way or another, I've been associated with the ISB uh, since it was first founded by Lee, Alan Adiram, and, and Rudy Abersold. And, and I had the privilege of serving as the board chair here for nearly a decade and have been on the board uh, since the time the board was first established. So I've had a chance to see it grow and I've had a chance to, to witness the extraordinary scientific accomplishments that have been made in this environment. That makes it a special pleasure for me to be here today and to speak with you a little bit about progress that we have made, but more generally that the scientific community has made in thinking about the relationship between the immune system, broadly speaking, and malignant disease. I'll have a chance to comment a bit on that, but I'll do so in the context of speaking specifically about the effectiveness of therapies directed against what are called checkpoint inhibitors uh, and trying to understand exactly how these things work and how to make them better. So uh, if I could, I'll uh, see if I can begin here and talk about um, the history of this field, which is a long one. Um, for many, many years, more than a century, uh, pathologists had believed that the immune system played an important role in the evolution of malignancy in the individual. And that was clear just from looking at tumors. If you look at uh, textbooks like Rupert Willis's Pathology of Tumors from now, I guess about 80 years ago, a book that I enjoyed a lot when I was in medical school, um, it was clear from just examining those tumors that a relatively small percentage of the cells in the tumor itself were epithelial-derived malignant cells, that a lot of the cells looked as if they were either stromal populations or sustaining populations or cells that were involved perhaps in the response to the tumor. And indeed, tumors do grow within an inflammatory milieu. And it was believed that it might be possible, given the fact that you could easily rescue immune cells from those tumors, that it might be possible to use those immune cells to actually direct the elimination of tumors. And those ideas, which were pursued by many over a period of, of more than half a century, uh, unfortunately did not yield much po positive data. Um, however, very recently we found a number of ways to use the immune system to eliminate tumors. W one way that you can do that is by direct immunization, and it has been possible to use uh, what are called cancer testis antigens like MAGE and uh, NYESO1 uh, to immunize people who have malignancies and occasionally see responses. But more recently, uh, other, other approaches have been used to increase the efficacy of immunization. One which we pursued at Amgen uh, was uh, the, the uh, defective herpes simplex virus called TVEC. This was a virus that was actually engineered by a guy named Rob Coffin at University College London. And, and the TVEC virus is a, is a uh, herpes virus uh, obtained in the, in the time-honored way. Uh, Rob Coffin actually cultured it from the lip of one of the people who was working in his laboratory and then engineered it to uh, contain a uh, cassette that expressed GMCSF, a cytokine that recruits uh, inflammatory mononuclear cells. Uh, and also made a couple of crippling mutations in order to reduce its neurotoxicity. And the idea behind it was, because it is directly cytopathic, one could inject it into tumor masses, and you would see those tumor masses destroyed. Rob Coffin is a virologist, so he would say that the, um, or did say at the time, that the virus was destroying the tumor. Since I'm an immunologist, I would say that actually what the virus was doing was priming an immune response directed against the tumor. Um, that turned out to be more correct uh, in this particular setting. If you actually inject this virus, the TVEC virus, um, into tumors, and this I'm showing you here a, a patient from a study that was done at, at Amgen. Um, patient has a, an advanced melanoma. You can see uh, representation of one of the melanoma lesions on the scalp on the left-hand side at screening on the top and the third cycle of injection with the cytolytic virus. Uh, on, the, on the bottom, and you can see that you introduce this virus and you get clearance of the melanoma in the scalp. 
But the interesting thing is that uh, in addition, this patient had lesions which could be identified in the liver, and you can see them at screening in two examples in the top, and then you see uh, what happens after a number of cycles of injection of the virus. The virus is being injected into the scalp, but the tumor is being eliminated in the liver. And that abscopal effect is a result of the stimulation of immune cells directed against the tumor. Now, of course, the virus does not contain any immunogens itself. It has a GMCSF cassette. It attracts immune cells. But what happens is, as a result of killing the tumor cells, antigens are released that are picked up by those immune cells, presented to an immune system, and that stimulation results in the killing of tumor masses elsewhere in the body. Um, the point to recognize here, and we'll see more of it in a minute, is that we are working on mechanisms that reveal the pre-existing immunity directed against tumors and provide a way to further enhance that immune response and to see, hence, the elimination of tumor masses. Um, if you look at TVEC treatment in uh, patients suffering from advanced melanoma in the registration-enabling study that was done at Amgen, you can see this is the time to treatment failure uh, plotted. Uh, and, and you can see that if you just give GMCSF, the cytokine itself, subcutaneously, and compare that with what happens with the TVEC administration, there's quite a dramatic difference. And that dramatic difference is what enabled uh, TVEC to be registered. The drug is actually uh, on the market uh, in, in the United States and is used, uh, although it is not used terribly frequently because it's fairly difficult to administer. I would say one wonderful thing about the TVEC virus is that uh, it, the side effect profile is extremely benign. Uh, so direct injection into the tumor of this cytolytic virus uh, does very little uh, in terms of adverse effects, but it has pretty dramatic effects on the tumor and particularly works in individuals whose tumors are not uh, terribly advanced. There are other ways to approach the same phenomenon that are more obvious and more straightforward. Uh, for example, by redirected lysis, uh, uh, we did this at Amgen with a, with a drug that's now available called blinitumumab or blincyto, in which one side of a, of a uh, what's called a bite antibody, uh, composed of single-chain antibodies. One side of the antibody is directed against the T-cell antigen receptor or a component of it, the CD3, uh, uh, a component of the CD3 complex. And the other side of it is directed against something that's represented on the tumor. And this has worked especially well in hematologic malignancies. Another circumstance in which you see uh, T-cell response to hematologic malignancies is if, if you actually engineer T-cells to have a receptor directed against those uh, malignancies. And, and that's done in the circumstance where you create chimeric antigen receptors, uh, introduce them into T cells in a patient, and put those T cells back into the patient. An example of that is shown here from a publication in the New England Journal uh, uh, three years ago or so that shows the expansion of the chimeric antigen receptor bearing uh, T lymphocytes uh, directed, in this case, against a lymphocyte surface marker, CD19, over time after you infuse them. And what, what's happening, of course, is that the cells that are infused, which can be seen in the boxed quadrant, the cells that are infused recognize the antigen and expand. Uh, and in doing so, they eliminate the tumor. The adverse experiences associated with this are, can be fairly profound, um, the reason being that you've got a lot of very activated T lymphocytes. And as a result, you have cytokine release syndromes, which are, are sometimes life-threatening. But it's a popular approach, and numerous companies have been established, including one called Juno here, and it's based here in Seattle, to try and uh, engineer, uh, develop more facile ways of engineering uh, chimeric antigen receptors that would be introduced into T lymphocytes. But to this point, the the approach that's had the most profound effects has been instead to try and release checkpoints that prevent the intrinsic immune response from responding appropriately to tumors. And the idea behind this is that, you know, ordinarily, when we look at cancer therapy in this sort of idealized plot, we look at survival versus time. And if you treat with conventional chemotherapy, uh, even targeted chemotherapy, uh, customarily what we believe we can do is shift the survival curve a bit to the right, 
um, but often not very much. If you look at the kinds of results that are achieved with traditional therapies, sometimes that shift to the right is a matter of just a few weeks. And that shift to the right of a few weeks is sufficient to gain registration, but there are a lot of adverse effects associated with conventional chemotherapy, and you wonder how much good you're doing. Keep in mind also that this is a population-based curve, so for any individual, the actual improvement that they see may be very, very modest. And, and the hope with immunotherapy is that through immune manipulation, you're able to actually put a tail on this curve, that there will be durable responses that last for a considerable length of time, maybe so long, in fact, that, that um, people will die of other causes. And we are already at the point where we're seeing those kinds of durable responses in many solid tumors, and we're seeing this kind of tail. And the question will become in the future, how do we actually bring that durable response to the vast majority of patients, as you'll see in just a minute. Uh, so how is this done? Well, uh, if you look at a T lymphocyte, and this is a, a slide that was uh, generated by Ira Melman at Genentech, uh, if you look at a T lymphocyte, there are a lot of regulatory molecules on its surface that offer potential leverage points, ways in which we could manipulate the immune system in order to uh, produce a, a, a salutary effect. Um, they are of two general classes, and I hear it's a great oversimplification, but just I would say that on the, the left-hand side of the slide, what you're seeing is a, um, a set of molecules which are potential targets for agonist antibodies. And what we mean by that is we say, well, okay, if we stimulate these receptors, we'll improve immune responsiveness. And on the right-hand side are a set of targets for antagonist antibodies. If we block those things, we'll reveal immunity that was otherwise suppressed. For, for many of these molecules, you can actually see their effects even if you uh, study T-cell stimulation in a dish. So in, if you set up the conditions correctly, you can show that uh, in the presence of a CTLA-4 agonist, for example, to choose on the, uh, the molecule on the top right, work that was pioneered by, by Jim Allison and his colleagues, uh, first at, at Berkeley and, and then at Sloan Kettering, um, that you CTLA-4 engagement actually has a suppressive effect on T cell responses. And if you can block that suppressive effect, then you'll reveal the immunity that otherwise uh, was not visible. Uh, so the two uh, molecules that have proved to be effective targets to this point are CTLA-4 and PD-1. But PD-1 is by far and away the most important target that we've seen in trying to manipulate the immune system. And I'll, I'll speak now about what we've observed using an antibody to block PD-1, which is really quite remarkable. So just to, to make sense of this in a cartoon form, uh, T lymphocytes recognize peptide antigens presented in the context of major histocompatibility complex molecules, as shown in, in purple on this slide. Um, but there are a lot of other co-receptors, if you will, that engage T lymphocytes. Here we're looking at a tumor cell on the top and a T lymphocyte on the bottom, and the end result of engagement of the T cell receptor could be activation, um, but that activation could be inhibited by, for example, the interaction of PD-1 uh, with its uh, cognate ligands, PD-L1 and PD-L2. Um, both of those, in principle, could be expressed on the tumor cell. So PD-1 is described as a checkpoint receptor. Uh, that the language that we use to describe it, and binding of PD-1 by its ligands uh, blocks T cell activation. And tumors, maybe unsurprisingly, um, are selected uh, in a way uh, that if a tumor expresses PD-L1 or PD-L2, it obviously will not be as easily uh, recognized or destroyed by the immune system. So you can imagine that this would be a good thing for a tumor to do. And um, by blocking PD-1, you can reveal effective anti-tumor immunity. So to do that, you need a high-quality antibody directed against PD-1 that effectively blocks PD-L1 and PD-L2. Um, some companies have pursued antibodies that block either PD-L1 or PD-L2, and there is uh, activity there. But in principle, you'd like to block both. Um, two companies have um, registered drugs that block PD-1. Uh, our own drug, which is uh, the generic name is Pembrolizumab. Its uh, brand name is called Keytruda. And Bristol-Myers uh, and their drug is uh, called Nivolumab or brand name Opdivo. 
So um, what does it look like? Well, the antibody is a pretty conventional antibody which has um, uh, roughly uh, 30 picomolar binding activity directed against uh, the PD-1 molecule. It is a, a human IgG4. It has favorable pharmaceutical properties, and it's administered once every three weeks by intravenous infusion. Um, it's uh, relatively uh, well tolerated, although I should note that when you receive an antibody directed against PD-1, the immune system more generally becomes activated, and the adverse experiences associated with PD-1 treatment, anti-PD-1 treatment, are typically autoimmune in nature. Um, so they include uh, autoimmune endocrinopathies, right? So uh, uh, hypothyroidism is seen in a few percent of cases. They include autoimmune colitis, inflammatory disease within the colon in a few percentage of cases. They include uh, skin reactions. They include arthritis in some cases. And they also include inflammation in the lung, which is the most serious, particularly in the context of, of patients with, with uh, pulmonary malignancies. Um, those things are, are a feature of the administration of the drug. And as we've treated tens of thousands of people, we find other examples of idiosyncratic autoimmune reactions. Uh, so it's important to recognize that these drugs do have adverse effects. But here's the kind of thing that you can see, and this is, this is a slide provided by Tony Rebus at, at UCLA, who's done a lot of work with us uh, studying the effects of the uh, molecule pembrolizumab directed against PD-1. In a patient with very advanced melanoma, you're looking at an um, a image of um, the patient's uh, pleural cavities. This is a, a slice through the lung. You can see um, it's with contrast, and you can see the heart represented there, as well as the descending aorta. And um, you can see this very large tumor mass, which over a period of a relatively few weeks just shrinks and goes away. This is after administration of just the antibody. There's nothing else that's doing this. So the antibody is administered. There are no other chemotherapeutic agents on board. There's nothing else to kill the tumor mass. And by virtue of interdicting a single receptor ligand pair, just blocking the interaction, in this case, PDL1 with PD1, the tumor shrinks dramatically and in many cases goes away. And melanoma turns out to be an especially responsive tumor. This individual had been treated with conventional chemotherapy and also with other immune manipulations and nevertheless was progressing. Um, and the last time I talked with Tony, uh, the patient is, is still uh, in, in, in full response. So that's quite a remarkable result for a person with this kind of advanced tumor. If you look at patients with melanoma, I'm showing you here a waterfall plot from a fairly large series of patients whom we studied early on in the analysis of this molecule. And about three quarters of the patients uh, show tumor shrinkage. The slide is colored to show you those individuals who never previously had experienced uh, ipilimumab, that's the CTLA-4-directed immune manipulator in yellow, uh, or those who had experienced it, um, shown in clear bars, it turns out not to make any difference. So that administration of an anti-PD-1 antibody, irrespective of what the prior therapy was, pretty much, um, has, has positive effects in about three quarters of the patients. Uh, one quarter of those patients do not respond. An interesting question is, what, what's What's the matter with those patients? We'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. But it's important to understand why patients don't respond. In melanoma, about 3 quarters of the patients do respond. And in many of those cases, the responses are quite durable. I think many of you know about uh, the example of uh, former President Jimmy Carter, who uh, had um, advanced melanoma, including uh, metastases to the central nervous system. Uh, and was administered pembrolizumab and, despite being 91 years old, had a very favorable response with elimination of the tumor, as near as one can tell, uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, th that's, that's a remarkable result. I mean, I have to pause for a minute and just say, those are remarkable results. That's very unexpected. Um, it would be enough, frankly, if we had an antibody that could do this kind of thing in three quarters of melanoma patients, that's a wonderful thing. But the remarkable uh, part about this is that that tumor shrinkage is associated with an improvement in overall survival, number one. It's durable 
It persists for a long period of time, number two. And number three is it works in an awful lot of different cancer patients with different tumor types. So here's what it looks like from the perspective of, of overall survival. This is, again, from registration-enabling studies done in the a melanoma setting. And what we're doing is comparing two different doses of pembrolizumab in red and green with the best available therapy at the time, which was ipilimumab shown in purple. And you can see in terms of overall survival, there's a fairly dramatic improvement. And there is the view that uh, out here, when you uh, start getting out towards a year and a half, these curves uh, tend to flatten uh, and um, overall survival uh, persists uh, at this kind of level. It continues to trend down, of course. No one lives forever, but, um, but nevertheless, uh, it is a pretty remarkable effect. And, and if you look across a whole range of different tumor types, you see a very similar kind of phenomenon. These are a set of waterfall uh, profiles, again, showing tumor response. The tumor either shrinks, it tumor goes down, or, or it expands, it goes up. And these are individual patients in each case. So we're looking at, at melanoma, where I've already shown you you have a, a majority of patients have a, have a response. But it's also true that you see responses in non-small cell lung cancer, uh, in squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, um, in urothelial tumors, bladder tumors in particular, triple negative breast cancer, not as many responses, but still, um, in gastric cancer. Um, this is the situation we'll talk about a little bit later in classical Hodgkin lymphoma, and here in a much rarer tumor, primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. So liquid tumors, solid tumors from a variety of different sites. In all cases, administration of a single agent to patients with very advanced disease results in a proportion of patients in dramatic tumor shrinkage. And where there are responses, they tend to be durable. This is remarkable and represents, frankly, the most significant advance in cancer therapy, I think, uh, since radiotherapy was introduced many, many years ago. So um, if we look at lung cancer as an example, uh, here's some data comparing uh, pembrolizumab, again, our antibody directed against PD-1, um, with the best available therapy, which is uh, taxane, docetaxel, uh, which is chemotherapy that's used in what's called the second-line setting. So patients who present with lung cancer typically receive uh, some kind of platinum-based therapy, and then when they fail that, which they almost always do, when they fail that therapy, they go on to a second-line therapy, which is often docetaxel, um, in, in the developed world anyway. And, um, and you can see the overall survival curve uh, for docetaxel, which is shown here in black, and then for two different doses of uh, pembrolizumab, you can see what the overall survival curve looks like in blue and red. Um, and needless to say, these are really quite different curves. And again, we have this sense, um, having median survivals um, that are extended out to this uh, duration, well over a year, uh, is unusual in patients who've already failed primary therapy for non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and this is irrespective of what the kind of cancer is, whether it's squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma or um, some un more unusual form. Um, and, and also we have this sense, as we uh, get more and more data, that the responses tend to last for quite a long time in these patients. So there, there is an interesting thing about this slide. I'm showing you an especially favorable result. Um, and the reason uh, that I say that is because I've shown, I've selected the patients here in a particular way. And that is, these are patients whose tumors express a high level of PDL1. So we developed a test for PDL1, and the logic behind our test when we developed it was, gee, as I've said, if PDL1 is expressed on the tumor, in some way that may be telling us that the tumor was selected for the existence of an immune response, right? Because it was advantageous for the tumor to express PDL1. It must be suppressing an immune response. So those might be the ones that would respond best if we <coughs> block PD1, because there must be an immune response that's working on them anyway. So why don't we try and amplify that? 
Um, and, and that was the approach that we took. It turned out to be a pretty good marker for responsiveness. And in these individuals that have a tumor proportion score, shown at the top greater than 50%, the responses are particularly good. If you start looking at individuals who have lower levels of expression of PDL1, by which I mean fewer cells in the tumor that are actual tumor cells express PDL1, the responses aren't nearly as good. And this very, very, very busy slide is a slide that I adapted from a presentation from Steve Averbush at uh, Bristol Myers. Um, and they are doing very, very similar work to us using their antibody, which as I said is called nivolumab. And what they've done is they've, they've fractionated their responses, again, in the non-small cell lung cancer setting, looking at the set of people who have greater than 1% of their cells expressing PDL1, or 5%, or uh, 10%. I need to pause for just a minute and say that every PDL1 assay that is being used out there is different, and you can't reason from one to the other. We're engaged in an exercise. All of the companies that are doing this work are engaged in an exercise trying to find some um, transformation table that permits us to reason from one assay to another and understand what they mean. It's not so easy. But anyway, that's, that, this is the result of their, their particular assay, uh, which is an immunohistochemistry assay that's very similar to ours. And, and the important thing to point out here is that, um, as they note, not everybody responds. The curves look better as you go to a higher percentage of cells expressing PDL1. And if you look at those individuals who have less than 1% PDL1 expression, you can see that actually the blue line um, here, which is the nivolumab line, looks worse than the docetaxel line shown here in green. I want to emphasize what this means because if you're a patient or a patient's family member here in these first roughly 9 to 12 uh, months of therapy, if you're the, the person who's here, um, you're more likely to die based on the look of this curve. You're more likely to die receiving nivolumab than docetaxel. And you would be better off if you could be on the docetaxel curve for a while and then switch to the nivolumab curve. Now, I'm making that statement as if there's um, statistically um, relevant, uh, a statistically relevant inference can be drawn from this. And we don't know that, but it, it certainly makes you worry. And indeed, if you look at individuals with a less than 1% PD-L1 expression, uh, what you find is that median overall survival is really no different for the nivolumab-treated versus docetaxel-treated patients. What that means is that you really, really want to focus your attention on patients in, whose tumors express PD-L1. So if that's true, you'd like to see if you could um, Get, a, get better predictive biomarkers, right? Because you'd like to be able to direct your drug, since it does have adverse effects, you'd like to be able to direct it at those patients who truly can, can benefit. And, and developing good predictive bio, biomarkers is very challenging. Um, uh, no test is perfect, um, as I think most of you know, but they can be useful nevertheless. Um, for example, the immunohistochemistry test that's used for HER2 as a way of identifying breast cancer patients who will benefit from treatment with Herceptin is clearly an imperfect test, but extremely useful in identifying responsive patient populations. Um, so we've explored this in some detail. If you look at, at the tumor proportion score, which we've used as a measure uh, using immunohistochemistry, and you just look again at overall response rate, this is just the, uh, those individuals who experience meaningful shrinkage in their tumor. And you compare those whose proportion score, the fraction of tumor cells expressing PDL1, is either very high, greater than 50% in red, or you know, very low in blue, less than 1%, or 1 to 49%. Um, you can see that um, in these individuals, whether you look at previously treated patients or treatment naive patients, uh, there is a relationship between PDL1 expression. Most importantly, that if PDL1 expression is very high, responses, particularly in the treatment naive subset, so this would be first line treatment of advanced uh, lung cancer, uh, are 50% are or in fact more. Um, so that's, that is an area where you like to concentrate your therapy, but it also raises some questions about what's going on in this patient population. Uh, PDL1 is for sure an imperfect biomarker, and you'd like to find ways to improve it. One question you have to ask is, well, what about PDL2? Well, PDL2 seems to be able to do everything that PDL1 can do, and perhaps a tumor that's not expressing uh, 
uh, PDL1 might be expressing PDL2. So we can look at that. And here's a set of, of studies which we did looking at PDL1 and PDL2 staining, which demonstrates that by and large there is concordancy, it's not perfect, between PDL1 and PDL2 expression. So the slide shows you PDL2 expression on the abscissa. Uh, versus uh, PDL1 expression on the ordinate, and you can see that it's possible to draw a regression line of sorts through these things with confidence uh, intervals for a whole bunch of different tumors. And, um, and there are nevertheless outliers, um, I can circle some of them here, there are outliers of individuals even in melanoma cases who uh, express PDL2 but not seemingly PDL1. Um, and clearly individuals who have PDL1 but not PDL2, and that could be relevant in terms of responsiveness. Um, the, the interesting thing, if you look at head and neck cancer as one example, you can see the effect of PDL2 expression here, just looking at PDL2 status versus PDL1 status, and looking at a response rate in these head and neck cancer patients. And if you look here, you'll see a 25% response or so in those expressing PDL2 and PDL1, as opposed to a, a somewhat smaller response rate, about half, uh, in those who are expressing PDL1 but not PDL2. That, that's, these are small numbers. Um, a lot more data is needed. But nevertheless, it gives one the sense that um, PDL2, first of all, probably has some sort of effect. We don't have a lot of patients in head and neck cancer who are PDL2 positive but not PDL1. But it has some sort of effect. Again, it's not the PDL1 or PDL2 itself. Those are not the targets of therapy. Those are just indicative of whether there's an ongoing immune response. Um, and th that's interesting because you can look in certain uh, examples where there is amplification of PDL1 and PDL2. Um, classic Hodgkin's lymphoma is an example of that as a result of uh, specific amplification of the 9P24.1 segment. And the reason why that's amplified may be because of the embedded PDL1, PDL2 expression phenomenon. It could be because of other things. But, but um, it's, it's interesting that when we looked at classic Hodgkin's lymphoma in that context, that's a place where you see really dramatic uh, tumor responses with, uh, in this circumstance, about 90% of patients having a reduction in target lesions after administration of PD1 blocker. So again, the presence of PDL1 and PDL2 which are not the targets of therapy, but simply indicative of the immune context, uh, appears to be meaningful in terms of identifying patients who will have the greatest response. So understandably, we wanted to try and approach that in more detail, and we've been working closely with colleagues uh, here in Seattle at Nanostring to try and look more broadly um, using uh, anonymized uh, platforms where we simply look at a lot of different genes, in this case about 800 um, sort of immune-focused genes and their expression patterns as a way of understanding whether or not there are better signatures that we can obtain that identify patients who would respond. And, and um, I'll show you some slides of, of sort of where this work is going. The, the logic of this is um, we've, we've tried to look quite generally and without, in an unprejudiced way at the expression of genes that identify responsive individuals. And what we find in every case is the thing that really seems to be important is the status of the immune system at baseline. Uh, the reason why PDL1 and PDL2 are good markers for responsiveness is that those genes are very responsive themselves to gamma interferon. So in people who have an immune response and are generating gamma interferon, gamma interferon directly upregulates these genes just as it does MHC class two and many other things. So the upregulation of those genes we detect with an immunohistochemical assay, but what we're really detecting is this immune-based signature. Um, that is, if we go in and look at more genes that are either themselves related to gamma interferon or in an expanded immune set, we can come up with uh, better signatures that help to distinguish responders from non-responders. And we've carried this work on uh, in quite some detail. Uh, to identify, for example, in the head and neck cancer patients that I showed you before, looking at PDL1 versus PDL2, we, we, we begin to identify uh, signatures that, at, at a minimum, have an impressive ability to identify those patients who are very unlikely to respond. So, if, if individuals have 
uh, immune signatures or gamma interferon signatures that are down in this range, they're extremely unlikely to respond because responders almost never have those kinds of things. And this is just part of a very large data set that we've generated. Um, the, the analysis in a one-sided test is statistically robust, um, and the signature keeps getting better and better as we go through more and more of these iterations. So it's really, it, it is, we're getting to the point where at least using baseline immune status as a mechanism of trying to understand what's going on in these patients, um, we can identify patients who respond. And if you look at the receiver operating characteristics for this kind of test, looking at sensitivity versus specificity, you can see that while it's not a perfect test, it's a test that's beginning to have characteristics that enable us to identify patients who are likely to respond. And I should say again that the negative predictive value of this test, uh, this nanostring-based test, is about 95%. So it's extremely rare for an individual with a negative test in this immune signature to respond. The positive predictive value is somewhere around 50%, you know, on a good day in direct sunlight. Um, and what that means is that you know, something on the order of, of one out of two patients or so will respond in the circumstance where they have a positive test. My sense is we can do better, although we may not do better looking at immune signatures, we may have to do other things. And in that context, it's worth sort of thinking about um, this plot. And what here we're looking at progression-free survival plotted against uh, the signature score for interferon gamma. You can think about it as an inflammation signature score. And up here are those individuals who are shown in red and blue um, who are responders. And you can see that there are very re few red and blue individuals down here, although there are some. Um, the black individuals are those who didn't respond, and there aren't any of those up here, um, but there are a lot of them down here. What that means is if you have a high inflammation signature score, you're very likely to have a good result in terms of progression-free survival. There are responders who don't survive for very long, but that's probably not, we don't, there are reasons why that might be true because there are other things that happen to people aside from the direct effect of the malignancy. And you can see if you have a low inflammation score, there are really very few responders. Um, and then there are some individuals, these are interesting individuals, who have an inflammation score, but they don't, they don't live for very long. Our question, of course, is how can we take all of these people and move them up here um, or at a minimum move them at least there if the inflammation score isn't terribly important. And, and so we're seeking ways of trying to understand who these individuals are and how we can move them in this direction so that they'll either be responsive to our therapy or responsive to some other therapy. One of the things that affects responsiveness appears to be the actual frequency of mutations in the individual tumor. And this is a plot that many of you have seen um, that was published in Science last year. Um, and it, it shows a representation of the baseline mutation frequency in um, tumors of a whole variety of different types. Over here, ranging from the leukemias and lymphomas, over here, all the way over to a bunch of different solid tumors on the right-hand side. Boxed in green are those in which we have unambiguously demonstrated favorable activity uh, of uh, Keytruda, pembrolizumab, uh, in these settings. PD-1 blockade actually does work in these settings. Um, PD-1 blockade does not work very well in prostate or in pancreas, um, although there are some exceptions which we'll talk about. Um, interestingly, uh, th there is there, the association between uh, a higher frequency of mutations in the tumor um, and responsiveness is made even stronger if you look, at, for example, at breast cancer or you look in colorectal cancer. In these settings, while there are some responses in these tumors, um, it's a minority of patients that respond. And those responsors are people who have, for one reason or another, an awful lot of mutations in their tumor. Um, so this is an example of a study that we did, the Keynote 16 study, which we did really it was done by the group at Johns Hopkins with Bert Vogelstein, in which we looked at individuals with colorectal cancer who were sorted for those individuals who had defects in mismatch repair um, this is, in many cases, the classical Lynch syndrome, but included others. So this is mismatch repair as identified by microsatellite. Um, and, and you can see, again, this is a, a change in baseline, some of the linear dimensions of the tumor, so a waterfall plot. And you can see that there are individuals, broadly speaking, whose tumors are growing and those whose tumors are shrinking. 
patients with colorectal cancer. And those who have proficient mismatch repair are largely over on this side. And those who are deficient in mismatch repair are over on this side, including some patients who don't have colorectal cancer but have some other malignancy, but also have microsatellite instability. Um, that includes some patients with pancreatic cancer, for example, which is otherwise refractory. The end result of this is it appears that uh, DNA repair, when it is deficient, makes you more likely to respond to PD-1 blockade. And the reason why that seems to be true is because of the accumulation of mutations. So here we're looking at somatic mutations at baseline in individuals who have mismatch repair deficiency. There are a lot of them. Those who have mismatch repair proficiency, again, as judged by microsatellites, there you know, are not that many mutations. And the ability to respond is more or less a graded function of the representation of mutations. So with more mutations, you're more likely to respond. These data were published in the New England Journal last year. We found another example of this, in addition to uh, this setting, um, that, that simply emphasizes the point. This is a, a 53-year-old 50 woman with, with endometrial adenocarcinoma who had been uh, extensively treated with uh, traditional chemotherapy, doxorubicin, cisplatinum, uh, taxanes, and, and radiotherapy. And after a couple of years had relapsed, and the relapse is shown in, in the retroperitoneal area and also in the supraclavicular area, and um, this patient was treated with pembrolizumab without much hope, frankly, but had a, a pretty dramatic response in terms of tumor regression. And it was of interest then, as we do with all of our patients, to examine the representation of mutations in these patients. And this particular individual uh, has a mutation in the Paul E gene and hence has another DNA repair defect. And in fact, we found quite a lot now of DNA repair defects of different types, which sensitize people uh, to treatment with uh, pembrolizumab. I should emphasize that while our general model for such things is that the presence of the mutations provides neoantigens that can be recognized by the immune system, and that seems a very satisfactory way of thinking about this, it's also possible that the presence of these mutations just makes the cells easier to kill. And because they're easier to kill, we see them as being responsive to an immune-based killing mechanism, but in fact it could be uh, have nothing to do with immune recognition per se. More work to be done to sort that out. So what I've told you about is that, that really immune cells can be harnessed to treat tumors, and we're having quite a lot of success with this. Um, it can happen with, with parenteral administration of tumor antigens or <coughs> using viral vectors, as I showed you, bispecific reagents. A lot of work being done with, with CART cells, chimeric antigen receptor-bearing T-cell clones, and of course, a tremendous amount of success with checkpoint inhibitors. Um, the checkpoint inhibitors now, uh, we're expanding in a great many ways. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you'll see that right now we have more than 250 clinical trials underway, more than 100 different combinations. We have nearly 20,000 patients under study around the world. It's an enormous effort, and we're clearly doing a lot of work to try and improve the way in which a, a PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor is used because we come fundamentally to this same question. And that is when you look at the set of responsive tumors, and most tumor types, there are responders. But typically, across a broad range of solid tumors, about a quarter or so of patients demonstrate real benefit in terms of, of durable tumor shrinkage. And we would like to get that quarter of patients to be actually uniform. We'd like to see the vast majority of patients respond. So let's think in general terms about that for, for just a minute. We know that immune cells are capable of killing tumors. They can do it in a lot of patients, and they can do it uh, in a whole variety of different tumor settings. So why would that fail? Well, conceptually, it could fail for three kinds of reasons. One reason why this mechanism might fail is because the tumor is actually invisible and no immune system could see it. It's just not possible to see the tumor a tumor that is deficient in matrix compatibility complex molecules and also not recognized by innate immunity could be completely masked and there's no way to find it. That's a possibility. Another possibility is that the tumor is visible, but just not visible by the immune system of that person. That could be because, for example, the immune system of that person is incapable of generating a repertoire that identifies that particular tumor. Possible, but over the years, I think the the 
times when we've invoked hole in the repertoire as a way of explaining immune deficiency, in general, we've not succeeded at that. I think it's more likely that the tumor is visible, the immune system is capable of recognizing it, but for one reason or another, it is either blocked from doing so or the appropriate cells have not been expanded. And that means approaches in which you combine immunization or other ways of making tumors more immunogenic along with a checkpoint blockade, that those might improve responses. And just to tell you anecdotally, um, though it's supported by a great deal more than anecdote, uh, if you look preclinically, essentially all mechanisms of killing tumors act at least additively with checkpoint blockade. So that includes cytotoxic chemotherapy, targeted chemotherapy, radiotherapy, all of those things tend to make tumors more visible, and as a result, you see more tumor killing. Indeed, it stimulated some people to think that part of the mechanism of action of cytotoxic chemotherapy and radiotherapy might be actually just providing immune stimulation, and that's how those agents have been working for many, many years. So it's natural to want to combine those agents in rigorous clinical trials, and we're doing that, and so are our colleagues at Bristol-Myers, and particularly at Roche, and also at AstraZeneca. Uh, and we're making some progress, and you'll be seeing results of combination studies. The goal for us is to try and reduce the very dramatic adverse experiences associated with classical chemotherapy directed against rapidly dividing cells, to reduce the burden of those adverse experiences while still gaining the positive immune stimulatory effect. There are also a lot of other checkpoint inhibitors to think about. And to better understand how to, um, to work on this process, naturally, we're eager to look on a cell-by-cell -cell basis and try and understand what is the immune repertoire and what's happening to those cells when we make these various manipulations. And, um, that, of course, we're doing with a lot of colleagues around the world using more advanced systems because, of course, T cells and B cells, for that matter, are very recognizable on a clonal basis um, as a result of immune receptor rearrangement. So we can find T cell clones and find what happens to them when we treat them with various immune manipulations. That work is ongoing and more to come, but already I think we're able to define some characteristics of repertoire that are important for anti-tumor response. Uh, so finally, I would say that the immune system, as you recognize, is a little complicated. Um, and it, all immune responses result from a balance of positive and negative signals, only a few of which are represented on this slide. But if you look at what's going on right now clinically, um, we are engaged in doing studies with um, inhibition of all of these are, are being pursued clinically, CTLA-4, PD-1, as you've heard about, LAG-3, TIM-3, in addition, uh, activating molecules, in particular Gitter and CD27 and CD28, have all been pursued clinically. And uh, lots of different combinations of these things together uh, with the idea in mind of, of tipping a, a what was a homeostatic balance uh, more in the direction of immune activation so that naive T cells that become activated are pushed in the direction of being uh, more active rather than being more energic. And it's the hope that with more active T cells, we'll be able to uh, produce more tumor shrinkage and more durable tumor shrinkage. And the key will be to balance that against the really quite severe adverse experiences that result from a broadly activated immune system. It is a wonderful time to be practicing immuno-oncology because patients are really, really benefiting. And not a day passes uh, that I don't receive a note from some individual around the world who has benefited from treatment with pembrolizumab. And that, of course, inspires me. But for every note that I receive about someone who benefited, I receive even more notes from people who did not. And that inspires me still further. Speaking as a physician, the, the most difficult conversation to have with a cancer patient uh, is the conversation in which you say, I'm sorry, there's nothing more that I can do. And my desire is to try, insofar as is possible, to end that conversation. Thank you very much. Take questions, Robert. Alan. I guess there's a microphone. 
Um, thank you. Um, Roger, you've um, shown, or, or your, the studies show, that inflammatory mediators basically are relatively good indicators, as you just showed, of efficacy uh, for, for blockade. Um, but it may also be the case that, that some of those inflammatory mediators are actually functioning as well in a more active uh, way, not just, and, and so on the one hand, the question would be, can one dig, dive deeper, seeing which, you know, if you have a general profile of inflammation, which ones are missing, and then co-administration of the relevant inflammatory mediators, and as an aside to that, um, the examples that you've mentioned um, have been in the elderly um, and, uh, you know, the one thing that occurs to one is that the elderly often have arthritis and other sorts of diseases where TNF might be produced and so forth. And is there some possibility that you're getting efficacy by co-administration of something li um, li like TNF or other um, in effective me uh, me mediators of, of uh, autoimmune diseases? Yeah, so several questions embedded in that. Um, you know, the, the first is, uh, among these things that we're just using as markers, uh, inflammatory cytokines, are there some things that maybe are actually having a beneficial effect as cytokines? And maybe not just one, but a whole cocktail of them. Um, that is very possible. We only have, the only thing we have to go on is the work that has been done in the past with administration of inflammatory cytokines particularly IL-2 as an example. But we know that stimulatory cytokines do have a favorable effect in some circumstances, but it's been extremely difficult to get a therapeutic index for those things because they also have, when administered systemically, have, have uh, severe adverse effects. At the moment, we can't tease apart those different pieces and it will become difficult to do so, although we can enumerate, of course, the levels of each one of the cytokines at, at a protein level and begin to also look at the at targets of those cytokines to understand what they're doing. It's a complex process to think about co-administration of uh, checkpoint inhibitors and whatever. Um, as you might appreciate, you know, the, the, the combinatorial nature of these things, even taken two at a time, uh, is such that um, very quickly, if you consider all the currently active chemotherapeutic agents, targeted agents, uh, and as well potentially cytokines, some of which have been active, uh, used in combination with, with uh, PD-1 antagonists with different doses and schedules, you fairly quickly outstrip the ability to do clinical trials. Um, it's also worth mentioning that, that uh, in the United States, as one example, only about 3% of cancer patients participate in clinical trials. So you actually can't find the patients to do these studies, and you have to go elsewhere, and there's not much better in Europe. So it's very hard to find the patients to do these studies and to do them in a rigorous manner. And I think what that means is that we just have to have better uh, preclinical insights in order to be able to do these experiments well, and we're struggling with that because we don't really understand what's going on in the tumor you know, in a time-ordered way. Um, we, we really don't, we're just beginning to once again re-explore these questions of when do tumors develop and how long do they persist in some kind of an immunologically constrained state and what makes them break out. Um, as regards the question of the elderly, it's an interesting one. Um, of course, tumors generally do occur in elderly populations. Elderly people generally have less immune responsiveness, but that I'm painting with very broad strokes there. The reality is that their uh, immune responsiveness tends to be perturbed a little bit, so there are imbalances. TNF is an example that you mentioned. Um, those imbalances could be critically important in terms of thinking about how tumors progress and why, if there is a homeostatic kind of state where tumors exist but aren't doing anything, why they might break free. And we're giving a lot of thought to those issues as well, but it's not, at the moment, very productive thought. Yeah, Tony. Oh, somebody over here. Yeah. So, so along the same line, so you show nicely that interferon gamma is a marker for response, but it, could it be also act as a factor because it's one of the strongest MHC class one inducer? And if so, did you look at whether interferon gamma increase is associated with more neo-antigen expression? 
Um, yeah, there's a general association between a higher level of gamma interferon expression and responsiveness. And, but of course, that association between gamma interferon expression uh, is also an association with almost all of the other immunologic markers and with PDL1 and PDL2 also. So it's pretty hard to tease it apart. And you're right, gamma interferon is a very potent and important regulator at a transcriptional le level for a whole variety of different uh, Im immune modulators. So it's really very difficult for us to understand it. At the moment, we're just using it as a marker. So the, the mutational burden data, the correlation between mutational burden and responsiveness is very exciting. I noticed that the exceptional responder that you pointed out, two of the therapies she had been on were doxorubicin and cisplatin, right? Yeah. DNA damaging agents. Sure. And so have you done any sort of you know, post hoc stratification to figure out what type of chemos these people have been on for responders versus non-responders, right? Were they yeah. on a DNA damaging agent? Yeah, it's, a great, it's a great thought. We've done a bunch of it, and the answer is there's no correlation. So it, it, the, unfortunately, well, I maybe fortunately, actually, pro, the prior exposure to the therapy doesn't have predictive value in terms of responsiveness to PD-1. What, what I will say in general, and this is sort of good news for all of us, um, and maybe unsurprising, is we tend to see more benefit and a higher proportion of patients benefiting um, in, uh, in naive individuals. There are some circumstances where you do see better responsiveness that's kind of relevant. It's a, it's a, it's not a, a, it's a DNA damaging agent. It's not associated with therapy. But you know, in, in lung cancer patients, if you were previously a smoker for a long time, you're much more likely to respond to pembrolizumab than if you weren't a smoker. Um, and th again, that association between um, mutational burden and responsiveness is, is quite clear in that case. Of course, you weren't smoking because you thought it would be a good therapy for cancer. <laughs> you, you were smoking for other reasons. But, but at any rate, that, it does have that effect. So, so an interesting question that comes now, now when a patient is, is diagnosed with lung cancer, the question is, are you, you, know, were you, are you a smoker? With the idea in mind that if you are a smoker, you're more likely to respond to the therapy. And it's good news, not if you're a smoker, you know, it's bad news. So uh, it's just sort of interesting that that's changed. Uh, so a uh, very nice talk, by the way. Um, so when you, at the end, when you're talking about uh, checkpoint inhibitors and immune activators, and of course the success so far has been mostly on the checkpoint inhibitor side. On the activator side, just intuitively, it seems like there might be more toxicity. And can you comment on that, or what are the challenges once a strategy? Yeah, so the, 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 you're exactly right. I mean, the, if giving an immune activator you know, seems like a dangerous thing, and, and there's clinical experience with immune activators, which is fairly scary. Um, so what that means for us, and certainly for regulatory agencies, is that you advance the exposure to these things sort of over geologic time. Um, so you, you begin with extremely low doses, and you very, very gingerly uh, increase the exposure to these agents uh, while you're following indices of, of immune activation. Um, we've been doing quite a lot of work with immune activators, particularly with uh, GITR, um, uh, where you know, the preclinical data are quite strong, um, mostly in monotherapy, but now we're doing combination therapy, which is even a little scarier a combination with a checkpoint inhibitor and an immune activator, and you know what could happen there. Um, and we are approaching it very gingerly. We're getting up to levels, getting close to levels now, which uh, in principle should be effective, and you know, touch wood if this is made of wood, uh, that uh, it, we haven't seen uh, systemic toxicity associated with that, but it, it's still early days. Do you think there'd be a strategy where you could do some kind of local administration of that, uh, and then hope that it would you know, expand and uh, yeah, there's the a science. lot of, of um, there, there are people who are freelancing those kinds of experiments. Uh, for example, a CTLA-4 blockade with ipilimumab uh, is associated with substantially more toxicity than is PD-1 blockade. Um, but, uh, you know, work that is being done has been championed at Stanford, for example, with local administration of CTLA-4 blockade and systemic administration of PD-1 blockade has looked interesting in some melanoma and otherwise refractory melanoma patients. There may be other examples of that. I'm certainly very enthusiastic about local administration of TVAC, the HSV, uh, defective HSV, um, 
that seems, that local administration seems to work extremely well in combination with systemic checkpoint in inhibition. Both CTLA-4 blockade and more recently our work in collaboration with our colleagues at Amgen with PD-1 blockade. I, I think there's a real opportunity there because again, not only do you have effect at the site of, of administration of the virus, but the abscopal effect on other tumors is amplified dramatically by PD-1 blockade. I think, I think that's going to look pretty good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this very informative talk. And here is a naive question. What would we know about the immune system of patients with meta metastatic tumors? So for example, are all your highly responders also having metastatic tumors or? Yeah, these are all patients with very advanced disease. So we, we are, while we have a few examples of, of early stage patients, we don't have many because, and I should have, I should have uh, made this point much more strongly. When you're developing a new cancer therapy, of course, you can't deprive a cancer patient of a therapy that's already been shown to work. So you begin with salvage studies in patients who have failed all therapies, typically who have very advanced disease and widespread met metastases in whatever tumor type you're looking at. If you can demonstrate efficacy in that setting, you can move up the line. And it, it, you start out as a, a third or fourth line therapy, you become a second line therapy, and you move towards first line therapy. In melanoma, we started out as a salvage therapy. We're now first line therapy for patients who have advanced disease. Treatment of melanoma in general for someone who presents with just a melanoma is local resection. And surgery works in a high percentage of cases. Although, because recurrences do occur late in melanoma, one could ask the question, Maybe it'd be a good idea to give them a little bit of PD-1 blockade at the time when you do the resection, and you could mop up some of those tumor masses that you can't see. That experiment will take many decades to perform. I look forward to reading about it from my bed in whatever nursing home I'm occupying at the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> Assuming I'm capable of reading. Great talk, and, and, but I look at this from the point of view of, di of screening and early diagnosis. And my question is, if you look ahead to that period when you are in your nursing home, what would you see as the right way for the medical system to catch these early and deal with them early? You know, it's a, it's a wonderful question, and um, I've been reflecting on it a bit because as, as we consider more and more about what's going on in, in tumor biology, the more I think about it, the less I think I understand. Um, we've tried to phrase this. For, for all the years that I've, I've studied malignancy in animals or in patients and thought about how one might treat it, we've tried to, to phrase this as, a, as a, in essence, kind of a war on cancer. Um, and, um, and we had this idea that these cells, that cancer is a, is a somatic genetic disease and there's a cell autonomous process going on. So cosmic rays or whatever, you smoke, you get mutations, cells gradually acquire a set of attributes that make them cancer cells. They become growth factor independent, they lose substrate adherence, they penetrate basal lamina, they do all kinds of bad things, they break off and they split and they're not, they don't play nicely with others, and they, you know, all kinds of bad stuff happens. But you know, as you look at it more and more, you begin to think of the tumor population, which has very few cancer cells and a lot of other kinds of cells, as something that you know, evolves over a long period of time and is really a, a system, if you will. Uh, and that's led me to ask questions like, well, what's so bad about cancer anyway? I mean, why do you die of it? What's so terrible? Because certainly in, in a preclinical model, just by giving you an active and antagonist, I, you can live with a very large tumor burden, two or three times your body weight. So what is it that's so bad about it? Most people don't die because the tumor mass impinges upon a vital organ, although some do. And since you can find, quote, circulating tumor cells in normal individuals, what is the status of those tumors that exist in all of us? And what has evolution selected for? Now, this is appropriate conversation for a cocktail party, not for a seminar here at the ISB, but it does raise a lot of questions about what would you do with an early diagnosis, and how would you intervene, and how do you know that you're doing any good, because the studies take so long to, to follow through on it. <laughs>